Thank you. So, as it has already been mentioned, uh, my talk will be to give you a little overview on the global vaccination coverage and to highlight some of the gaps and also to link that what we already heard already yesterday from the keynotes and also today about the importance of the data, of the availability of information, of the correct interpretation of the information and of the quality of the data. Oops. I already have a problem here. I can probably just do it here. Hello? Ah, okay. So let me start with the slide Thomas already have shown you, which shows us the great progress on immunization coverage over the years from the different antigens. And just to remind you that the target, the goal is 90% at global level and at all countries. And then you can see that at the top part of the chart, shows the, the vaccines from the traditional vaccines, what we often call as basic or traditional vaccines, which is the DTP, the three dose of DTP, the three dose of polio vaccine, one dose of measles vaccine, and the highest green line actually shows the f coverage from the first dose of DTP vaccine. And I'm showing here the first dose of DTP vaccine to give you some idea how many infants actually have at least one contact with immunization systems. And we can see that quite a few children, we actually are reaching 90% to get one contact with immunization systems. However, when we look at the coverage with multiple doses or with new vaccines, we see that we are still lacking reaching the 90% at global level. If we look at the how it's distributed over the 194 WHO member states, we can see that the dark blue shows the countries where the national coverage has already been reached in 2013, represented by three doses of DTP-containing vaccines. And we can see that about 66% of member states actually reached that national coverage um, of the targeted 90%. However, we still have countries, seven countries, cannot even reach 50% of their, their infants with the three doses of basic vaccinations. Um, and I would like to remind you from Thomas, you heard that the global goal is not only to reach 90% coverage at the national level, but also to reach 80% coverage in each district of the country. And currently in 2013, only 58 member states or 30% have reached 80% coverage in all of their districts. So we are still quite high, uh, quite far from reaching the goal. If we look more closely where those children are who are not reached uh, with full immunization or at least par partial immunization, 21.8 uh, million children are still missing the full benefit of vaccines. Uh, and 70% of these children live in 10 countries in 10 countries where coverage is lower and the biggest birth cohorts are, such as India, who is responsible for about a quarter of unvaccinated children, Nigeria, Pakistan, Ethiopia, DR Congo, and so on. So if we can focus on 10 countries, we can probably reach the global goal already. If we now plot the countries with their coverage in 2013, uh, where the x-axis uh, represents the DP3-1 coverage and the uh, y-axis represents the DTP3 coverage, where we can look at what actually are the problems in immunization program, where is the problem in access, and where is the problem in dropout. The top corner shows us the countries where we actually want to be with all countries when the job is done and our only, only uh, goal is to sustain the high coverage, which is also challenging if you remember from Thomas's presentation, in some regions where they already reached 90% coverage, coverage is now slowly declining. And then we have countries 
where we are able to uh, reach the children with at least one dose of vaccine, but then the problem is to keep the children in the, in, in, in the system and to get them complete their vaccination schedule. And then there are other countries where the dropout is not that big for the children who have access to the immunization system. However, not all children have access to immunization system, so there are issues with equity or vaccine hesitancy or other problems. And then, of course, we have a few countries under the red triangle where we have a problem with both access and dropout. And oftentimes, those are countries in crisis or countries where have a really, really bad information system. So having said that, and giving you a bit of an overview, what is the situation in 2013, keeping in mind that the goal is to reach 90% coverage in all countries by 2015 and 80% uh, in all districts. Uh, let's see what can be also the potential reasons where the coverage is not reached. So for immunization, why we saw that many, many things have changed in the last decade or so, or since uh, the last 40 years when immunization programs started, and we saw the number of new vaccines, we saw the increasing population. We also know that now we want to reach not only infants with vaccines, but also moving into children and adolescents. But to vaccinate, we first need a vaccine. And as Thomas already pointed out, in many countries, we are reaching vaccination shortages. We are reaching vaccination shortages for many different reasons, but when there is no vaccine, we can certainly not vaccinate. So on that note, I would like to focus a little bit, not only on coverage, but on what else is needed to make sure that we increase the coverage. The importance of the data and of the good quality data in all level to be able to drive the immunization programs. We not only need data at the global level to monitor progress toward our global goals, but the data is very important down at the health facility level, district level, and national level to empower the program managers to, <coughs> to drive their programs, to make sure that they understand the gaps and to reach that fifth child with the life-saving vaccines. So the data is needed for action, for strategic decision, such as uh, to be able to decide what strategy needs to be applied to the country. Is it an issue with a dropout or an access? What, is the, what are the root causes for non-vaccination, parental refusal, or the vaccine is just simply not available, or the attitude of the health workers, and so on. For operational decisions, who are the children who need to be immunized this week? How many of them? How many vaccines is needed? Uh, the list of unvaccinated children, the system, the reminder system. And of course, for managerial uh, decisions, such as the stock availability, uh, the percent of wastage and the reasons for it, uh, are the fridges on the appropriate order, uh, the workload per vaccination, and cost and funding decisions. Uh, so data is really crucial to make sure that we actually uh, manage our program properly. What can we do to make sure that the data we are using for the managing the program is an appropriate quality and is interpreted in a correct way? There are some fairly simple things to do, such as the things like a regular data review and data triangulation. Um, although it's really obvious, but sometimes just the things like to make sure that the completeness and the timeliness of the data, uh, to make sure the data is internally consistent, not to look only for the uh, uh, single data point, but to look at the time series and interpret the data accordingly, to look separately to the numerator and denominator, and not only to a coverage, and to use information to multi for multiple sources, not to only rely on coverage data, but to match it together with disease surveillance, with SOC data, and look at the plausibility and interpret it accordingly. Uh, the immunizations programs have some tools, such as data quality assessments, uh, which help them to review the, the, the quality of the data, the flow of the information. However, just reviewing and, and, and uh, identifying the issues are not enough. What really needs to be done, and often is not done, is to link these findings to action, to integrate this recommendation to an annual work plan, 
and to include the review and monitoring tools into the information uh, and the review of the information system into the classical review of EPI program and the post uh, uh, introduction evaluations, which are already existing tools, and, and, and look at the immunization program functioning. And lastly, but very importantly, the training and the uh, supervision. In all trainings and the supervision uh, visit, it's not only to, 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 to look at the, at the performance of health workers, but also to look at the monitoring tools, to make sure the monitoring tools are available, to make sure the health staff is properly trained and understands the importance of a recording and reporting. And just to give one um, uh, example, for example, the internal consistency of the data. And this is a real, real example from a country. And the green light represents here the coverage of a certain country over time from the uh, three doses of DTP vaccine. And what we can see that the country in 2000 had a fairly low coverage with a steep increase for almost over 100% coverage and then a deep decrease, and then the coverage steadily increased again uh, up, up until 2013. If we only look at the coverage data, we can wonder what happened, what, what caused the, the, the deep decrease, and what is behind this data. However, if we just disaggregate this data and look separately for the number of doses administered in this program for the period of time, we have a very different picture. We see a steady increase over time, and we don't see any deep uh, decrease. So what happens here, that if we look at the target population, we can observe that the target population is probably not really represented properly. Unless something really dramatic happened in this country, the target population really increased very uh, dramatically between 2006 and 2007. So what's really happened in this country uh, during where one can interpret very easily as a big decrease in a coverage was actually uh, the time when most likely a new, new um, population data was available for an immunization program. And therefore, uh, instead of revising the time series, the country just applied the new population data, which caused a big decrease in the coverage, which was completely artificial. So what is also very important, and often is not happening, is to look at this time series and interpret the data accordingly, and if it is needed, to revise the time series. And this is something which happens very seldom. Immunization programs often find it very, very difficult to go back and revise their time series and say that what we thought before is actually not true. And of course, because of the data quality, often revision of time series also means decreasing the coverage, which cannot then be very difficult to explain. Uh, to move more forward, uh, so we can see that in immunization programs, what is really important, not only to monitor the administered doses of vaccines, but since we translate the vaccines into the coverage, the coverage has two components, and the second component is the target population. And the target population also has a very important role. And over here in this chart, what I'm trying to show you is the effect of an error in target population into the coverage estimate. And when we have a low coverage, um, then the effect of the error of the target population is very little. So in the early years where coverage was low, if our true target population, let's just imagine this number is 100, and we have an error at 10 percentage plus minus error, so the real population is somewhere between 90 or 110, our true coverage of 10 percent translates into between 9 and 11 percent. And this is really not significant with that low coverage, it really makes no difference. However, how coverage increases, the error of the target population becomes more significant. At 50%, uh, our estimated target uh, coverage would translate into between 45 and 56%. And still, that is not that significant. We know that at around 50%, this is still a low coverage. It's still a lot to do. However, as coverage goes higher, with our now to, uh, targeted 90% coverage, if we have a 10 percentage uh, uh, error in our target population, which is very possible, 
uh, then our estimated coverage can be something between 82% and 100%. And that is already quite significant, especially with vaccines where we really know that, uh, that in order to reach elimination, we need a very high coverage, such as with measles vaccine. Uh, so it also shows us the challenges as the coverage gets higher to estimate the coverage with a precision is becoming more and more challenging. Um, and that's also translated somewhere, sometimes also when we interpret the data. It is also very difficult to interpret very small changes in the data from the administrative systems because we are really not able to measure with a precision such as small changes like increase from 90% to 91% is actually virtually impossible. So when we interpret the data, it's also important to understand what is behind it. Another example of looking at uh, consistency, um, immunization programs definitely need data from administrative system. Data from administrative system is crucial because it provides information timely and it helps the programs to manage their immunization program on a day-to-day -day basis. However, we know that administrative systems often do have a problem and therefore it's also important <coughs> to validate data from administrative system with data from coverage surveys. And these two examples here, I'm showing you the example on the right hand side, where the administrative data, which is represented with the red dots, is very consistent with the periodic survey, uh, survey data, which suggests to us that this is a well-performing pro program with a fairly high coverage and, and with a fairly reliable data. On the other hand, on the other side, we see a program showing a a very uh, different administrative coverage from the survey coverage. Administrative coverage shows a very big increase in a program, then a big deep decrease, and then again quite a, um, a big increase. However, the survey data suggests a much lower increase. We can still uh, 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 see some increase, but it's much lower than what the administrative data suggests. So in this case, uh, one can conclude that the administrative system is probably not reliable and it needs to be revisited and needs to be addressed uh, before some uh, decision is based on the administrative coverage data. So coverage surveys are important. There are three main uh, household uh, uh, surveys which are measuring immunization coverage, the DHS, the mixed surveys, and also the EPI cluster surveys. Um, it's a very good way to periodically validate an administrative system. And it also provides additional information, not only about the vaccinated children, but also about the children who are uh, not vaccinated or not completed their vaccination uh, schedule. So it also helps us monitor missed opportunities and timely vaccinations. However, surveys also have limitations. Um, firstly, surveys provide us information much later than the, the, the actual intervention happened. Usually with the surveys, we measure coverage from the previous birth cohort, and also it takes some time by the time the data is collected, analyzed, and published. So often gives us information only a year or two years after the intervention, which might be a bit too late for managing the program. And also the survey is as useful as the quality of survey. And it's not only about the design of the survey, which is very important, and to make sure that we design our survey accordingly to what we want to measure, but the implementation of the survey. And oftentimes in the places with the difficulties where our administrative data is very unreliable, those are the places where to well implement a survey is very difficult as well. And therefore the survey data might also be a questionable quality. Also, as we saw from Thomas's presentation, uh, there were really big changes, especially in the last decade. If you just compare 2000 and 2013, in this world map, I'm trying to show you the number of antigens in different countries. And you can see that in 2000, in most of the countries, especially in the developing countries, and I actually excluded BCG from here because BCG is not recommended in every country, uh, they were five antigens, which was the basic antigens, the three doses of DTP, measles, and polio in most of developing countries. But in 2013, it really increases, and, and children by the age of one are receiving as many as, as eight, nine, and 10 antigens. 
So with the five visits, a child receives 10 antigens, and with one visit, it can be as, as many as three injections and two oral vaccines, which leads us to the questions of care caregivers' recall. Because the survey data, the surveyors, they are looking for documented evidence, but when documented evidence is not available, they rely on mother's recall. So how good is the quality of the survey when the mother needs to remember that in a previous year with how many vaccines the child got vaccinated in a, in a one visit? And that is quite challenging. So while many ch things have changed in the immunization field, it is something which haven't really changed since the um, beginning of the program, and that is the immunization cards, the home-based records. They were provided from the very, very beginning of the program, but somehow this is a little bit of a forgotten tool and really not uh, utilized very well, while it's a very, very useful tool. It really provides a great uh, coordination tool for the health uh, service workers between the different health services and, 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 and over time. It really helps communication between the healthcare worker and the, and the mothers and the caregivers. It empowers the, the parents to be able to know the immunization status of their children. It also health, uh, serves as a reminder for the next visit. And then in this changing world where private sector also plays more and more of an important role, it really helps even if the child changes the health facilities to give a good record of the immunization status. It also prevents us from revaccination of the children, and we know that although we are debating about the vaccine prices, it's still some of the new vaccines are not cheap, so it's not really the best way uh, and most effective way to revaccinate the same children over and over with unnecessary doses, while we can easily record and keep track of immunization status with the home-based records. And finally, home-based records are really a great aid for public health monitoring as well, because during the coverage surveys, they provide documented evidence about the immunization status of the child. Also, not only there are much more vaccines available nowadays, but it has been a great change during the last decade also in technology. And uh, therefore, we also have to bear in mind that monitoring and evaluation can be done quite differently now than 40 years ago. And so from the purely paper system uh, where recording was done with a paper and then kind of reported further, we can use information and communication technology to help us to improve the data quality. Uh, with the data collection, the facilitation of the collection and trans uh, transaction of the data can be done really easily. Um, immunization registries are a great opportunity to do things differently, and also transaction of stock management systems. Uh, the transmission of the data becomes much more quicker with the online or mobile reporting. The data is available in real time and in many different levels, and it's much more easier to, to, to uh, aggregate and analyze which leads us to the analysis of the data with the electronic word now producing visualization can really help us to, to lead us to potential problems and gaps and also to, to um, look at more than one data source in a simultaneous time and try to find different gaps, not to mention the uh, possibility of the GIS system, as we have seen from Thomas's presentation already, how we can track now migrant and, and underserved populations uh, thanks to the GIS system. So there are great potentials to actually improve the monitoring, the data availability, the data transmission, and also the analysis of the data to make sure that the data is used for action and eventually lead us to a higher coverage as well. Of course, there are also limitations. Better systems, better technology alone will not uh, translate into a better information system. We also need people to work together. And then technology cannot easily change incentives and behavior itself. 
So technology also needs people, needs understanding, needs training. But when it's well done, it can be a very powerful tool and it can really provide us with better information and translate into a better job. And just finally to mention something what can be really a great help, especially nowadays with the increased number of vaccines, with the technology being available, and, and with the different issues of, of, of reaching the children, and those are the electronic nominal immunization registries. Of course, again, the registries can only help if they are well designed, if they are covering most of the birth cohort, uh, it it's, it's, it's needs a uh, unique identification for each individual, but then it has information about each person, in, including information about the geographical area of the residence, information about the vaccination given, the gate dates and the providers, and it allows us different aggregation by geographical level, by social economic status, and it can really lead us very easily for different analysis to identify where are the gaps, where are the problems. Um, it also allow, allow us to timely follow up of individuals. Um, the data entry can be much closer to the vaccination. The data entry can be directly at the health facility level and then available in, in all other additional levels. But of course, it has different issues and problems. It requires technology, it requires investment, it requires training, and then an issue with the data security at data protection as well. But it can provide us really great opportunities to reach the fifth child. So in conclusion, while it was a great increase in global coverage, global coverage still hasn't reached targeted 90% in all countries, and especially 80% in all districts. For successful immunization programs, timely and high quality data are essential. Regular assessment, desk reviews, data visualization, help improving data quality and they're better interpreting data. Periodic coverage surveys needed to validate administrative data system. Home-based record is a simple but very useful tool to, to, info, uh, to, to capture immunization status. ICT can help if appropriately used and capacity building is essential at all level to better utilize the immunization data. Thank you. Th thanks a lot. Well, time for some questions. I, I, I'm not sure I can name another baron, a British baron, but Josiah Stamp is a 19th century baron, uh, industrialist, economist, a banker. Um, my first day as an EIS officer, I was faced with this quotation from jo Josiah Stamp. The government are keen on amassing statistics. They collect them, add them, raise them to the nth power, take the cube root, and prepare wonderful diagrams. But you must never forget at the end of the, these figures comes the fact that in the first instance, uh, from the, village, the data comes from the village watchman who just puts down what he damn well pleases. So I think it sort of reminds us that the importance of the source of data and how the things we do with it. So open for questions or comment. Thanks, Bruce. Susan McKinney, USAID. Um, so Marta, thanks so much for a really good um, presentation. I, I think it um, kind of brings me back to what is good basic EPI programming about? Um, and I think that uh, in, the, in, in, our, in our current uh, environment, we, we all tend to get a little keyed up about lots of exciting innovations and new and different ways to do business. But when we go back and we look at basic coverage rates and we look at the continued shocking rates of dropout between DTP1 and DTP3 or between DTP1 and, you know, uh, first measles, measles one, um, I think it should speak to us all about what is good basic programming and I certainly am one who firmly believes in um, expanding equity and access but at the same time we're really not capitalizing we continue not to capitalize on low-hanging fruit and um, and that is low-hanging fruit I know people feel like oh that's all gone we've picked all the low-hanging fruit if we've still got DTP1 
coverage at 90% or we've got BCG at 90 or 95%, we're, we are just, uh, as a global immunization community, still kind of failing on some of those basic uh, immunization programming principles that have been around for decades. Um, second point on this question of surveys. You know, um, Nigeria is very much a focused country for many of us on uh, shifting uh, the paradigm from not just to focus on ending polio transmission, but really getting into routine immunization. Um, we have funded UNICEF's utilization of smart surveys in a much more significant and consistent way um, to take a real good look at EPI and routine delivery. So smart surveys are being done in Nigeria in all the 36 states and the FCT every six months. Um, and it really doesn't cost a whole lot of money. I would be curious to know your views on um, uh, the quality of the surveys, if, if you have had experience with it, because I think it's an inexpensive tool that will maybe help us um, break up the reliance, shall we say, on the DHS um, debacle, uh, you know, or discussion, I should say, around every five years is not frequent enough. Those are really, really expensive surveys. What can we be doing better? Thank you. But I completely agree with you with the low-hanging fruit, and that was exactly the point, that in many programs, the children are reached at least once, so the job needs to be finished. And and we definitely need to keep in mind that they are tools and, and, and strategies which have been there already and has not been fully utilized, and we just have to do that. In terms of the surveys, I haven't really had a chance to very deeply look at the SMART surveys, and I'm sure that they have a great potential. I think we somehow, and I agree with you that DHS is expensive, it's a very big survey, it's not only focusing on immunization. Immunization programs often also a little bit questioning how well the survey is done, especially with a very complex immunization uh, schedule now with the new vaccines uh, included, which might be included just around the survey, so the survey data can be misinterpreted, the documented evidence, which is an issue. I think we somehow need to find the right balance. I think ultimately, immunization programs need to, need a really, reliable information system in the program, and I think that should be the ultimate goal for everyone. But meanwhile, periodically, they need coverage surveys for reality check to see if the information system still works properly. And in countries like Nigeria, where a lot of things happening in, 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 in a short amount of time, there are additional tools definitely needed, and one can be the smart survey. But then I personally feel that then a question is, should we then institutionalize these smart surveys forever? Or is it just a tool to bridge some period between having a reliable information system? And, and I think that the latter should be the case because no matter what, surveys are still expensive, still time consuming, and still give us a result a little bit later, even when it's done in every six months. So I think the right balance is very important. I have, a, I have a macro question and a micro question. The macro question is, if you were forced to say on a scale of 0 to 10, with reasonable resourcing, how are we doing in terms of having the data we need to do the job properly? Are we a 0, are we a 2, are we a 5, are we a 7, or are we a 10? Just without starting the, re the reply with it depends. Just, and then the second is, from a micro level, what are the three things you would do to make the most progress in the, in the shortest, the most shortest time? Uh, <laughs> it's difficult to say without that. I can say at the global level, I would say seven. But I think it really needs to translate down to the, sub, to the national and subnational level. And then probably where it's more needed, it might be two or three. Uh, Between two and seven. <laughs> And what are the three things you'd do to change that? <laughs> I think to matching the technology 
with the human capacity, with the capacity building. So to make technology available, but then to train people. And this behavior change, when the data becomes valuable at the lowest level as well, and the big data became used in all levels. The data is not collected just for the sake of collection and reporting up, but this behavior changes of using the data. I think that would really make a change. And the, and the ownership of the data and the sustainability of the availability. electronic immunization registries, which uh, Marta talked about, I think all of us should recognize that it's a, it's a long-term investment. It's not going to get short-term gains. My sense from talking to people in middle-income countries and even in higher-income countries on the time it takes to conceptualize, design, pilot, and scale up an electronic registry is at the minimum 10 years. Uh, that's how long it takes. I think even countries like the U.S. are struggling with uh, electronic immunization registry after a lot of investments. Uh, so I think that's the ultimate goal, but it's not a short-term solution. I think, but we need to invest in it in as, as a as a long-term uh, solution. Uh, and and as Marta said, it's not just the technology alone. Uh, the most difficult part in many of the countries is the time to scale up is to get equipment and the technology down to the grassroots and to have the trained manpower to man those systems. That's what takes a lot of time and effort. Any other questions or comments? Go ahead, yes. Introduce yourself. Yes, Mark Chataway. Um, I'm a, a consultant who works with a lot of not-for-profits and, and companies. If these data are um, inaccurate, they're not necessarily inaccurate all in one direction, are they? I mean, they may be understating vaccination as often as they may be overstating it, or would you not agree? The, the thing that prompted the question is I was, was very struck when we were working in India that um, for women who don't have their vaccination cards, as most don't in India, um, they had to answer a series of questions about what had happened in immunization that most of the experts couldn't answer. And if they fail to answer those questions, the child was classified as unimmunized, when partially immunized. Do you see that anywhere? Yes, I mean, and, and even uh, with the example of, of, of also the target population, the data can be also underestimated and overestimated. However, I do believe that at the global level, and with some push of also for the performance in many programs, immunization is one of the measurement of a performance of the health system. I think it's still biased over rather an overestimate than the underestimate, especially in the last decade. But there are certainly some places where it's an underestimate. And certainly mothers can probably fairly well recall, but it's getting more and more complex because when a child needs to receive five different intervention, it's getting a little bit tricky. And I mean, it's, it's, it's getting challenging, but definitely it can go in both direction. Hi, thank you for your presentation. Uh, Anupama Tantri with Merck Vaccines. Um, I'm just wondering if you could comment a little bit about um, as we look at the life cycle of vaccines and as we have more and more adolescent adult vaccines sort of what's the thought where they're being delivered in a variety of different environments and, and how the global community can start to capture some of that data um, in terms of coverage and, and access. So these are now the challenges where we are really moving from the classical infant immunization to the child immunization and then adolescent immunization. And that's again kind of gets also a little bit into this behavior and mindset changes as well, because the immunization programs were thinking infants for 40 years. Now to change that, that's a new challenge. And we have the great uh, uh, experiment in front of us is the HPV vaccination, which is delivered in a completely different age group, in a completely different setting. And in many countries, school immunization is something which is, which is 
quite common in many countries. Many countries actually do offer school immunization and the school immunization programs are, are fairly strong. At, at the national level, this is often monitored and, and with, with the good school immunization programs, that's, that's part of the monitoring system. At the global level, I must admit, we have been neglecting this up, up until now. We are starting to correct it now and to make the, put more attention into, for the HPV vaccine with the introduction, we started to collect the information. Although out of about 70 countries already introduced, less than half of the countries provide us with some data and we are not even asking the coverage data because it's again quite challenging because of the different age groups to define the target population is already more difficult. But we only asked a number of administered doses per year, and even that is quite challenging for the countries to report it in a regular basis. But that's, of course, an area where we need to now work and to, uh, as Thomas mentioned, the integration to work with other programs, not necessarily the classical immunization program, but, but also reproductive health and adolescent programs as well. Just a quick one. Um, the, the question about data collection and data quality about life course, um, it made me think about whether your answer to Michael's initial question about where we are on a one to 10 scale, w was that optimistic seven uh, focused, did your answer focus on infant immunization data as opposed to life course? Because I think if you ask the question how far are we away from life course data quality and integrity? That that I'm not sure. Is there a negative number that might? <laughs> Let's just keep it positive numbers. It was about the infant immunization. The life course would go down probably to around two. Okay. 